everybody. My name is Dolores O'Riordan. I'm the director of UCD's Institute of Food and Health. I'm delighted that you can join us this evening for our public lecture on food waste, and it'll be delivered by Associate Professor Tom Kern. We still have, have people joining, but I think we'll get kicked off um, in, in just a moment. To briefly introduce uh, Tom before he begins his presentation, Tom is an Associate Professor in the UCD School of Biosystem and Food Engineering. And from next week, he's taking on a further role within UCD as the Vice Principal for Internationalization in UCD's College of Engineering and Architecture. From a teaching point of view, he is the Director of the MSc in Environmental Technology degree program. His research includes waste management and air quality and he was the key researcher and coordinator of a Horizon 2020 AgroCycle project on recycling and valorizing waste from the agri-food sector. And this involved 26 partners from all over Europe and indeed partners from China as well. In 2018, he was awarded a Fulbright scholarship and he traveled to North Carolina State University to advance his research. Prior to joining UCD, he worked in production and environmental management within the, the food industry. So the series of public lectures are designed to give you the scientific expertise behind interests of public interest. So I'm delighted this evening to present our expert, Associate Professor Tom Kern, to speak on food waste. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, so my talk this evening is on uh, food waste. So if you split those two words apart, uh, food generally would be seen in a very positive light and uh, the word waste would be a very negative uh, connotation. So if we look across the uh, supply chain from farm level to the fork, uh, to the kitchen table, uh, we can see here where uh, we can get uh, losses. So losses are in terms of uh, food is, uh, de is uh, defined as spilled or spoiled food before it reaches the product or retail stage. And then food waste is considered, considered food that's fit for human consumption, but not consumed due to spoilage or discarded by retailers or consumers. So you can see there's a big gap there from the farm level right through to the retail level in terms of food losses. And then there's a huge amount of losses at the retail level and also in uh, terms of household consumption as well. So looking at this uh, pie chart here for EU food loss and waste, we can see about half of uh, the waste occurs at household level. Uh, we also have a lot at uh, the processing, almost uh, one-fifth. Uh, food service such as hotels and restaurants account for 12%. So overall, the European food loss uh, and waste together is in the order of about 80 mil 88 million tonnes per year. And that would be equivalent to about 21 times the size of the Eiffel Tower in terms of volume. So it's a huge amount uh, to visualize in that way. So getting on to Ireland then, every household in Ireland generates over 100 kilograms of food waste every year. And if you look at it in terms of money, then it's on average about 700 euro per household, but it can vary between about 400 and 1,000 euros worth of food that's thrown into the bin. And obviously food waste that goes to landfill, if it does end up in landfill, that's going to break down and release a methane rich biogas, which is a greenhouse gas uh, that's 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So if we examine food waste at the household level, 60% is avoidable. So that's things like plate scrapings, leftovers, spoiled fruit and veg, and uh, passed by uh, date perishables. And then 20% is potentially avoidable food waste, things like bread crusts and potato skins that could potentially be used in other dishes. And then 20% on top of that is unavoidable, things like banana skins and uh, chicken bones. So this is very much tied into uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we have a chart here on the right hand side here, 
which shows uh, progress towards achieving the 17 sustainable development goals according to the European Union. And this report was released in summer last year. So you can see um, number 16 there, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. They've made significant progress in the European Union on this. However, if we look at food waste, this comes under uh, 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And uh, moderate progress has been made on this. Uh, the target, uh, the specific target for 12.3 is that by 2030, half of the uh, food waste per capita should be uh, reduced. So there should be a 50% reduction in uh, food waste at the retail and consumer level by 2030. And also losses should be reduced along the supply chain. So uh, looking at the food waste hierarchy, we have um, the general waste hierarchy, but there's a specific uh, food waste hierarchy. Uh, the key to it all is to prevent waste happening in the first place. Uh, you can also feed people or redistribute uh, surplus food. And as an example, as uh, food cl cloud is uh, shortly in, in another couple of slides that I'll be talking about. And uh, we have the next option is to uh, feed livestock and that's using excess food uh, unsuitable for human consumption as animal feed and so on down. We have anaerobic digestion generating biogas for energy and biofertilizer from uh, the leftover food. And we have compost as another option, making compost from unavoidable food waste. And finally, we have disposal at the bottom, which can be either landfill or incineration as last resorts. So uh, Food Cloud, as I mentioned, there is an Irish uh, social enterprise and uh, they became uh, known as uh, the way to connect between um, supermarkets and um, charities. So the way it works, the, the one on the left there, the item highlighted there, Food Cloud Retail Solution, is that uh, they have a mobile app where uh, super, supermarket managers can contact the local charities saying that they have uh, food available that's uh, still in date, but it's available to share with charities. They also have other innovations um, such as uh, generating apple juice there, as you can see, and gleaning uh, leftover uh, vegetables in fields uh, after harvest. And they also have the Food Cloud Hub solution. So another thing that has come onto the horizon in the last few years, especially at European level, is this idea of the circular economy. So uh, typically we have in the past been uh, working in a linear economy so that we make things, then we use them, and then we dispose them. So now we have to think differently in terms of a circular fashion. So we should uh, design out waste and pollution where possible. Uh, we should keep products uh, in circulation as long as we can, sorry. Um, and we should also uh, regenerate natural systems as much as possible. So this is uh, taken from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, so I mentioned, uh, it was mentioned earlier that I coordinated um, a European project called AgroCycle and uh, that involved uh, looking at uh, materials within the bioeconomy. So this is where you use re renewable biological resources from land and sea, like crops, uh, forests, fish, etc., and microorganisms to produce food, materials and energy. So this is an example in this diagram here how the project worked. So in the centre you have food processes and um, production at uh, farm level as well for plants and livestock and taking the residues from that um, from uh, food processing factories as well and retail and seeing what you can do with them. So um, one option is to create energy, uh, biofuels, uh, electricity etc. Another option is to go down the biorefinery route where you make biochemicals, biopolymers, nutraceuticals, etc. You can also generate uh, biofertilizers for uh, farming. And that's going to be a big thing now in the future with the new uh, EU fertilizers regulation where they're uh, cutting back on the proportion of uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, promoting the use of uh, organic fertilizers, biofertilizers, and also promoting organic farming. So we have 
um, water, uh, wastewater coming out of these food production processes as well. So you can harvest biomass from that to create animal uh, feedstock as well there. So um, some, uh, some of those uh, research um, projects that are ongoing at the moment, some of it is uh, looking towards the future and some of it is still based in the laboratory. And uh, one of the things that I should have highlighted there, just going back, if I could just go back there for a second on the AgriCycle project, one of the things that we made from the project, I don't know if you can see this here in my hand here on the screen, but these are plant pots and uh, these are made from uh, potato fibres. So if you take the peelings from uh, potatoes that would be used say in chip factories or crisp factories, you take some of that and you combine it with polylactic acid and you can make these biodegradable plant pots. So again, this was something that was done at pilot scale level. Uh, it hasn't been commercialized fully yet, but there are other alternatives available on the market as well. So as I said, some of those things are still at pilot scale or lab scale uh, type uh, production at the moment, uh, just proven, proven uh, concepts uh, to a potentially uh, commercialized in the future. So I'm just going to give some examples now of things that are maybe at a later stage uh, and actually in, in um, you know, commercial applications at the moment. So a simple thing is like that if you take uh, residues from um, the uh, food processing sector, you can actually feed them to animals. So one company in Ireland has uh, created a brand called Olive Pork. And uh, what they do is they take the olive pomace uh, after the olive oil is taken from it and uh, they feed it uh, to pigs, uh, a certain amount of their pigs, and um, they claim that it has a, a distinctive uh, flavour after that and that they have improved levels of omega-3 and uh, added health benefits. So another example of an Irish company that is involved in the circular economy is Hexafly. So they actually um, create, um, they generate insect protein and um, they make that into products for animal feed, uh, plant feed as a fertilizer and also for aquaculture. And we're gonna see more of the, these insect protein products in the marketplace in the future. So they actually take um, waste or well, let's, call, let's call it residues from the, the um, food industry like vegetables, uh, for example, and um, they basically have insects, um, black soldier uh, fly larvae, they break down the, um, the, uh, the food or the feed um, byproducts and they, they create these new products from it in, into insect protein. So I remember I was at a, a conference a few years ago, an environmental research conference, and I actually uh, got some freebies from it, uh, which um, incorporated, they were actually um, protein bars, but they inc incorporated uh, crickets and uh, insect protein. So I gave them to my kids when, when I came home and I was, but um, when they saw that there were crickets in it, they, were, they weren't too impressed that they don't ask for freebies like that anymore from conferences. But it just shows you that, you know, that insect protein is going to be part of um, the future as well. So there are a few projects ongoing, uh, some of which involve uh, UCD participants at the moment. There's, so there's a, a Science Foundation Ireland um, Innovation Prize, there's a food challenge, there's also a plastic challenge going on at the moment too. But it's all about the idea of uh, food waste and um, making things more sustainable in the future. So one of the, the people that's involved in uh, a project there called IQ is um, Dr. Anastasia Kenodaki uh, from UCD. And uh, she's working with Ulta McCarthy from WIT and Jean-Pierre Emond from the Illuminate uh, company as well. So they're looking at using optical sensing and artificial intelligence to predict food quality and shelf life uh, when it's applied to fruit and vegetables as fruit and vegetables, they really account for a massive amount of waste, a large amount of those uh, fruits and vegetables uh, go to waste. And uh, another uh, um, colleague in UCD, Professor Paula Burke, uh, she's working uh, with other researchers in TU Dublin and um, the Irish Fish Canners Company as well. And uh, they have a project called Blue Stream Bio, and uh, they're looking at uh, reducing uh, waste in fishing and aquaculture and uh, creating bio-based products and uh, bioplastic materials as well. 
Another company, or uh, sorry, another project in that SFI challenge is called WAVA, and that's uh, focusing on valorizing food waste into value-added commodities. So Dr. AJ Menon from the School of Agriculture and Food Science in UCD is working with LIT and food surplus management there. So there's a, a lot of details in this uh, particular flowchart, but it's looking at food production, mapping the raw materials that could potentially be used and uh, treated with pulsed electric fields. Then it goes through modified anaerobic digestion, uh, potentially creating uh, palm, oil, palm oil alternatives. Then it goes through further um, processing. Uh, some of the byproduct goes into photobioreactors, creating microalgae and then they create more uh, upgraded food or feed as well. So again, another example of a circular economy. So we have um, an EPA project also called Symbio Beer that's uh, run by IMR and in conjunction with St. Mel's Brewing in Longford and uh, Panelto Foods nearby there as well. So they are creating uh, a beer, a Belgian style beer, um, and they're taking uh, bread residues from Panelto Foods uh, to create this. Uh, meanwhile, the St. Mel's Brewing are giving back to Panelto Foods some um, used grains, uh, distiller grains from their uh, process. So it's a good example of what's called industrial symbiosis. So uh, the residues from one, um, say, location or organization can be used as a raw material for another organization. So another project uh, that I've been working on in uh, particular has been the idea of the fat, soils and grease uh, coming from uh, kitchens, commercial kitchens and also domestic kitchens. And these cause major blockages sometimes in sewers in, in cities in particular, and these are called uh, fatbergs. And uh, it's a particular problem in the UK, um, but in Ireland even there are about 7,000 blockages caused every year uh, in sewers and in the UK it's a, a different scale uh, altogether it's uh, about 300,000 uh, blockages every year in the UK so it's largely caused by these fat soils and grease residues which uh, wash down through sinks um, but also um, added to by uh, people flushing wet wipes uh, down their toilets as well. So um, the fat oil and grease residues th these are basically food residues uh, coming from uh, cooking utensils and dishes etc. If people uh, concentrated a little bit more and dry wiped their dishes and their cooking utensils into their food waste bin there would be a lot less of these blockages and also commercial kitchens have to implement uh, grease trapping uh, technology in their kitchens to uh, capture uh, the uh, residues. Uh, and uh, in the background also we have uh, policy and social and economic factors leading to the way people eat and obviously at the moment uh, during the current situation we don't have uh, many food service outlets in operation but we have uh, in general uh, an increasing global urban population and this trend is, is going to increase. We're going to have two-thirds of the world population living in cities by the year 2050. So looking at municipal solid waste management, uh, the kind of the chain of uh, movement in it. So on the uh, left hand side, we have our typical bins. Uh, we have a brown bin for uh, food waste, uh, organic waste, and we have a black or gray bin for residual waste and green bin for uh, mixed dry recyclables like uh, paper, cardboard, uh, tins. So on the red bar here, we have how it's collected. So Ideally, waste should be collected in separate fractions. So that means we separate at source, whether it's a commercial kitchen situation or, or domestic houses. Ideally, that food waste in particular uh, should go all along the top line there into anaerobic digestion and composting. So we can get some useful uh, products out of it, um, fertilizer, uh, compost, and uh, biogas for energy production. Um, some of it, the municipal solid waste will also go towards recycling. Uh, some of it also will go through sorting processes, um, which leads to more recycling. And some of that residue will go to incineration with or without, without energy recovery. What we don't want to see is, is some of that going to landfill. 
down on the bottom here, we have what happens when uh, waste is uh, collected as a mixed bag effectively, where say on the street uh, bins, where you can throw everything into it. There's no uh, separation at source. Um, a lot of that will go into incineration. However, some of it will be uh, pre-treated and sorted out. Some of it will end up in composting, but it's much less valuable when it's mixed like that compared to the uh, situation above where we keep food waste separate. So we have targets to achieve in Ireland as uh, we do across Europe. And uh, these are set by the landfill directive, the European landfill directive. And uh, this is how Ireland has been performing over the last number of years. So we were set targets to achieve, to reduce the amount of biodegradable and municipal waste going to landfill BMW. And that includes food waste, but also garden waste, anything that's a biodegradable. So the problem with the biodegradable waste is that when it breaks down, it creates the methane-rich biogas, which is, escapes into the atmosphere as a, a greenhouse gas. So that's uh, the main reason why we want to prevent that going to landfill and going to better, it's better going to anaerobic digestion or composting instead. So we've been doing quite well um, since 2010. We've been achieving targets and even last year um, in 2020, it's estimated we sent about 100,000 tonnes uh, to landfill and we're well below our uh, target level. So um, what happens then with the food waste that's collected? Well, not everybody has a food waste uh, collection. Obviously, you can have a home comp composter as well. And uh, these are, um, this map here shows the food waste uh, collection areas where there are brown bins uh, being collected. And uh, the law says that anywhere there is uh, an agglomeration of people over 500 population, uh, there, there needs to be a brown bin uh, collection service. So if you live outside of those urban areas, you're not going to have a brown bin collection. So um, this map here shows organic waste facilities. So it's a little bit out of date, but it has most of the facilities uh, shown here. Um, the, the yellow ones are um, uh, quality approved composters. Uh, compost facilities. So these are industrial compost facilities. So these are places where your organic waste, your food waste goes. You also have um, the red ones, which are uh, Department of Agriculture approved compost facilities. Uh, the blue ones are where only green waste is composted. In terms of the, the uh, green ones there, there's anaerobic digestion facilities. Um, Again, this is not showing all of them as a little bit out of date, but the general um, trend you can see there is that there's a lot less anaerobic gestures south of the border compared to north of the border. So in terms of what you can put into your um, food, food bin or your brown bin, as we call it, um, on the left hand side, we have the green tick marks. Basically, you can put all uh, different types of food in there. Um, but it's very important that you don't contaminate it with what's on the right hand side of this uh, diagram, which is uh, packaging. So plastic packaging, glass or metal, um, we don't want to see that in the recycling bin. So um, plastic is another uh, a challenge. Uh, while it's not exactly food waste, it does have an impact on um, what you can recycle and what happens to your food waste afterwards. So we don't want to contaminate food waste with uh, plastic or other types of packaging, but it's a massive problem. We seem to be in love with plastic uh, packaging here in this country, in Ireland. Um, so for example, you know, we have um, problems with all the plastic bottles we use and the, there is a plan, there's a waste action plan at the moment out for consultation and um, that will roll out uh, deposit return schemes where you'll be paid to bring back your uh, plastic bottles. So as an example of a, a challenge I said to, to my students in one of my modules in UCD over the past uh, few weeks during this current uh, lockdown, they all worked from home in different teams and they used their plastic bottles that they found at home in their bins to create uh, different um, kits, which were uh, the idea behind them was that it would be for, um, say, uh, homeschooling kids to show children at maybe primary school level or er early stage uh, secondary school how, what you can do with plastic. 
Um, obviously, you can recycle it into different products, but if you take plastic bottles in your home, you can um, slice them up in different ways uh, with simple cutting techniques. And uh, this here on the left hand side is an example of a, an outline of the frame of a house uh, completely made from plastic bottles, no adhesives or screws or any fixings. On, on the right hand side, this is an example of a, a geometry kit that could be used for teaching uh, uh, primary school children about different shapes and you can see how it's uh, held together by the plastic bottle caps there. Um, another thing that we need to look at as well is zero waste shops uh, and again this comes down to packaging and obviously we don't want to have packaging um, combined with food waste um, so if you, we can reduce our, our packaging and use refillable containers whether it's using it for bottled water refilling our bottled water or um, bring it to the shop and, and reusing it in, in these types of situations. So there are a few zero waste shops in Ireland. Uh, this one here is uh, one in Westport and there are a few around Dublin as well. There's also one in Clonakilty. So you bring your refillable container and you fill up with your, your dry goods there. So uh, some concluding remarks now. Um, as I highlighted earlier, if we look at the uh, waste hierarchy, um, uh, we need to focus our efforts on uh, prevention. So that means raising awareness at homes, at schools and colleges, what we can do to prevent waste happening in the first place. Um, we need to consider um, the connection between climate change and the circular economy as well. We want to reduce our emissions. Um, and we can do this by reducing uh, food waste because food waste in, in uh, a global uh, level is responsible for about eight to ten percent of overall greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to really work on that uh, over the next number of years. So the target for food waste reduction, cutting it in half by 2030 is very, very challenging and it's going to take uh, effort on everybody's behalf uh, to achieve that. We also need to uh, refocus our efforts on separating waste at source in businesses and in households because cr cross-contamination um, between food and other types of packaging, it actually reduces the um, what you can do with the waste afterwards and where you have a lot of cross-contamination, it's more likely that the waste is going to be down downgraded and maybe sent to an incinerator instead of a more beneficial uh, recycling effort. So I'm going to leave you now with some uh, resources here and um, the Environmental Protection Agency has a really good website, a lot of waste uh, statistics there. They also uh, support and fund uh, a campaign called Stop Food Waste and that has really good uh, information as well uh, and so does mywaste.ie and uh, there you find a lot of information about say what you can put into different bins and also how to set up uh, home composting. Uh, Voice Ireland is a, a very good uh, charity as well and uh, not, for, not for profit organization and uh, they come out and give talks and will uh, come into different organizations to do say lunchtime talks about uh, recycling as well. Uh, I think the uh, Conscious Cup campaign is very worthwhile too and uh, that's where they're promoting uh, refillable containers and even in the current situation I think uh, the idea of contactless coffee is really good and uh, I think it should be promoted more and this is where if you have a refillable container obviously people when the pandemic uh, hit first they probably were thinking well you know my container might be contaminated possibly with the virus but contactless coffee avoids this so you bring in your um, coffee cup your refillable coffee cup you take the lid off it put it on a tray and uh, the person then will uh, serve you with the, the coffee without touching the actual the coffee cup at all and then you put back your lid on it again. Refill.ie uh, shows you a map of all the places where you can refill your water bottle, your refillable water bottle. Um, the Community Resource Network Ireland also has very good tips on uh, reuse and repair of uh, different items, household items. As I mentioned earlier, Alan MacArthur has a very good uh, website on the circular economy. And then in terms of uh, media uh, resources, I would recommend that you have a listen to um, the uh, Down to Earth uh, 
podcast with uh, Dr. Cara Augustenberg uh, on News Talk. Uh, it's on every weekend on a Saturday evening, and you can download that also as a podcast. Uh, they had a recent episode, I think it was about last Saturday week, on um, waste as well, which was also very helpful. So um, thank you uh, for listening, and I hope you uh, found uh, some useful tips there.